Hey, good morning guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're doing a real world exercise, at least one that I think is real world and applicable to emergency communication. I had an experience I'm gonna talk about in a bit that prompted this video, but today's objective is to be able to send priority or emergency traffic to one or more loved ones, uh, basically my family, through another operator that's in my network that I actually trust to send that message and get to that destination. Our X factor is to do it in such a way where we actually don't leak any type of personal information, first name, last name, uh, phone number, email, things of that nature. So stick around. I basically just pulled off of Highway 74 at about mile marker 15. I went on what looked like a uh, utility road and we're gonna go ahead and try to use the gear that I have to make that happen. But stick around because I'm gonna talk about four things that are actually required to do this in practice. There are no free lunches in radio. So stick around and we'll talk all about it. All right guys, so I'm a man portable field operator most of the time, so for me to bring my small HF equipment, it's not a huge deal. I've got this small $8 Harbor Freight bag that has my antenna system, my radio, my analyzer, and everything I need to hopefully make this happen. My uh, trusted uh, person in my network is a little over 200 miles north of my position in Henderson, Nevada, and I'm gonna use him as a trusted relay without leaking any of the information about my family that I need to contact. Just need to put the 40 meter link. I just put my uh, antenna laser on and we're at a very good match for 40 meters. And I don't want to belabor the point here, but this is a rushed improvised job. I've got the apex at 10 feet and then I basically have one of the links out here. And in fact, since I am in the desert, I've become accustomed to not having another support and uh, just using the truck and pole in this configuration uh, with a single guy point, using the same gear to make my shelters. Uh, it's actually pretty effective. So uh, yeah, we'll see how we do. All right guys, so for this exercise, I'm gonna use the digital mode that I train with most often because it works really well under uh, less than ideal circumstances like this location. We're gonna see if I can send a targeted message and the goal for today is to send a message payload that our group has come up with and it's fairly simple. It's the designation, the uh, your status, and the short message. The designation is basically a ID. I've used India for in-state contacts, Oscar for out-of-state contacts, and I've numbered them one, two, three, four, etc. And then in terms of uh, that card that I hand over to one or more people in my network, it's got that person's first name and their preferred and secondary a method of communication, whether it's voice or text or email. Well guys, we got a little bit of a problem. While the antenna system is tuned properly, uh, I'm not really getting out and being heard by my actual network. I am seeing a couple of other stations there, but they're not a station that I want to relay traffic through. Um, I think the problem, and I was pretty sure it was a bad idea coming this way, I've got these high tension power lines right behind me. All right, so I don't have time to move to another location. Uh, while the antenna setup wasn't too terrible this morning, it did take me about 10 minutes to set it up. Uh, I honestly wish I had brought my NFED half wave because uh, I could basically just go straight off the Jeep to a single point on the trekking pole. So we're gonna try one more antenna. These power lines are giving me a problem. So I'm gonna use a vertical and a vertical isn't great for uh, the regional communication we are doing, but it has worked for me quite a few times. So there still may be enough high takeoff angles for it to shower down that uh, within 300 mile range. So we're gonna deploy that one. It's really quick. In fact, it was the antenna that I was gonna deploy uh, first. Actually, I have it right here. And this is the uh, Chameleon uh, Hybrid Micro. And I like it um, because it is super compact. It has a ground stake system and then a 17 foot telescoping whip. Uh, the only reason I don't use it all the time is that it does require tuner uh, in the way that I have it deployed as a poor man's vertical. Dang. There we go. Yeah, 
this is kind of nice for the uh, field expedient deployment, but uh, we'll see how it works out. We need a ground radial. We're going to choke it off at the feed point with this uh, RG316 that has the uh, snap-on ferrite beads. All right, so you can see here the uh, SWR is uh, much higher than I would ever use on my uh, 818 here, so we're going to have to run the uh, the tuner to get a good match for the radio. All right, so this is interesting. Um, while the person I want to talk to who is in my network and was the point of this video um, is not on, uh, I actually do have quite a bit of other people. I did a generalized heartbeat just saying, hey, who can hear me? And it's a lot of the operators that I actually know. In fact, KM7N, uh, he's a local here in Arizona. Um, I could presumably reach out to him. Uh, and I've got a couple of other people, especially at a station out in California that I've also talked to um, over the phone and a few other things. Um, he would be an option here. But the whole point of today's exercise was to do this uh, securely without leaking any information. So for this all to work, it's predicated on the fact that I was able to send a message to someone in my known network. Um, I'm not going to give up quite yet because, like I said, I'm about an hour early. Uh, 1700 UTC is when our band actually opens up. We do have one backup, I'll tell you. Um, and I don't like it because it will absolutely fail when stuff goes sideways. But we have good luck uh, getting from my position in Arizona to uh, Henderson through a linked repeater system called the uh, Intertie system. And uh, it has failed in the past. In fact, while we're waiting for the band to uh, open up, let's go ahead and pop in the Jeep and see if we can get him that way. All right, guys. So I'm back in the Jeep here. So... This is a dual band rig, and I'm going to try to get into a repeater station that is in Scottsdale, uh, 441.625. And uh, this station is part of the intertie system. Uh, again, I don't want to resort to repeaters, especially link repeaters, but we're going to give this a try. KC8OWL, KT7RUN portable. Are you around, Mike? All right, we can't make it into that repeater. There's another one that's in um, the white tanks that's farther out at elevation. We'll try that one. And that one I just switched over to it is on 442.275. KC8OWL, KT7RUN portable. Are you around, Mike? Welcome to this ARA repeater on North Link T. So guys, we're going to have this be a failure video. I think this is important to note. Hopefully he's monitoring. So in our plan, we also monitor this uh, set of repeaters throughout the day. All right, sounds good, Mike. Sorry to bother you. I am fully deployed. I've been deployed here for about uh, 45 minutes running two antenna systems. And it is a complete fail. I think this is going to be a failure video with lots of lessons learned. I actually took a, a utility road with high tension power lines ooh, about 100 feet behind me. Um, I was looking for a place where I had access. And it's also about 45 minutes early before the band really opens up for us. Have you seen any of my JSA traffic? All right, Mike. So uh, let's do this. I think I have um, real deaf ears right now. I'm registering an S8 on my meter, which is uh, probably a signal of the uh, high tension power lines. But uh, what I want to do is I'll try to head or try to go ahead and send you traffic via JS8 since there's no infrastructure. But I'd like to do it now as well. So uh, please be ready to copy the following relay to India one. I say again, India one. Okay, on Highway 74, mile marker 15, one mile south of the high tension power lines. ETA, two hours. QSL? He got that wrong. Back to you. 
Correction on the highway, it is 7474-74 QSL. Roger, roger. Correction noted. Highway 7474. Back to you. Alrighty, sir. Thank you so much. I'm going to pop over to the uh, JSA call station. We're going to try one more time on both antennas. If not, if you don't hear from me, please uh, relay the message as described. Anyways, thanks for helping me out on this video. Lots of lessons learned. Going to be a fantastic after-action report. Uh, happy Sunday, sir. KC8OWL, KT7RUN, clear on your final. All right, guys, so I copied that same message into JSA call here. We're about, uh, ooh, about 40 seconds into the transmission, but all I put there was relay to I1 or India 1. That's the designation for someone in my network. Okay, I'm fine. And then a brief message on my location. So I put on Highway 74, mile 15, one mile south of Powerline ETA, two hours. I should have probably gone on the slow mode. I did normal. Uh, like I said, these power lines were a really bad uh, location for me to camp out next to. So in about eight seconds, we'll see if his station acknowledges. If it is, we've actually successfully done it. We, we did it with the... Uh, dipole deployment uh, in a compromised position and location and it looks like there's a signal coming through right here so I think we did it I hope that's his signal on 1900 Hertz uh, offset boom we did it all right guys we're gonna do an after-action report at the house so really appreciate you guys hanging out with this one um, I've been filming with my phone just to not get too tied up in all of the production I want to talk about content comms are hard Let's go back, we'll do the after action report. And like I said, there are four things that we're going to talk about that you need to do if you want to try to do true off-grid communication. And it's not going to be easy. All right, guys, I've got a lot going on, so we have to make this after action report very quick. I'm going to read off my notes, but uh, right off the bat, I'll have to say that this exercise, while it started rocky, was 100% a success. Uh, my wife did receive both of those text messages via the relay, and it was done so with operational security in mind. Her personal details, contact information were not leaked, and that was the goal of this exercise. Further, we were able to do this with two modes of communication. One was using voice through a linked repeater system, and the other one was without any infrastructure on my end directly to my relay using HF and we did that using JSA call as a very powerful weak signal mode. So I think in general, we're gonna call this one a win, but we do have a lot to talk about in terms of fails, as well as a few other notes that I think are important. So let's take a minute and talk about what prompted this video or video idea. I had been traveling back from California into Arizona and I was taken off the highway on Interstate 10 via a detour that took me through some rural farmland and then dropped me into an area that I was not familiar with called Box Canyon. Basically there were rock structures on either side and I was in a dark territory where I had no cell coverage. It wasn't the end of the world even though my check engine light came on. It tends to do that when you end up in situations like that. And it would have been nice to be able to communicate to my wife that I probably had close to a two hour delay making the cross state trip back home. So in that particular case, it wasn't like how the preppers like to think, oh, it's World War III or there's some other uh, major SHTF situation. This was something where only my end of the infrastructure was impacted and I did have the tools at my disposal. Typically I would have my satellite device, my Garmin InReach Mini, but since I did not trail run when I was out of state briefly, I did not have my pack that normally has that. So that's on me and HF would have been the only way to do it. I'm actually kicking myself for not doing this exercise, but then again, I did not have that portion of the plan that provided the operational security. The goal with this exercise was to hand over a field card we're going to talk about to people in my network that would have that personally identifiable uh, contact information that we don't necessarily want to leak over the air. So like I led with earlier, uh, there are really four things that make this type of emergency communication possible, and it's not going to be easy. The first one is the easiest in terms of effort. It just requires finances, and that's having the right gear for the communication task at hand. Uh, 
On most of my trips, I will bring my small HF radio. I'm running the ASU FT818ND, which is discontinued. I ran it at anywhere between 2.5 to 5 watts for this exercise. I had two antennas. One is a simple wire dipole design uh, by myself and Tim N9SAB. Uh, Tim did all the work, but I uh, had some requirements for him. And the other one was a vertical antenna by Chameleon called the Cha Hybrid Micro. So I always have those two because they all fit in that little bag. Um, I additionally used the Jeep to support the system, but that is not technically required. But since I had the Jeep, uh, having the mast was quite easy. Uh, I also had in the Jeep a dual band mobile rig. I have the Kenwood D710GA. So that also made the ability for us to go through the linked repeater system very easy to do. So the second thing that you need are the skills. I've been working at this for almost four years. May will be four years for me being on the air. So that required me to get my technician license, then my general class FCC license, and then I basically tried a lot of different radio operating techniques and modes, everything from FM simplex to voice repeaters to link repeaters to digital modes to HF voice and HF digital. So depending on who I want to contact in my network and where I am physically located will dictate a lot of that. So I can't underestimate the value and importance of skills and training. Almost forgot. So along those lines, the other person or the other people at the other end also need to have the same capabilities that you may have in terms of gear and skills as well. So training is not just for you, it's for somebody else. Which brings me to the third thing that you need, and that is a network of trusted operators that you can support and whom will support you. And this takes time. There is no easy win for this. Um, Mike and I, for example, the gentleman that helped me uh, do this, we train every single day. We have a combo window established where uh, basically the first couple of hours of every morning before we both get to work, we monitor the link repeater system uh, to get us all the way from Arizona to Nevada and beyond. But then we also will monitor HF on 40 meters pretty much the entire day. So we have the ability to uh, have constant communication. Uh, we may not be at our system, but it gives us the ability to uh, receive messages and then respond asynchronously at our convenience. All right, so number four is the plan. So this takes a little bit of work. And like I said, my goal here was that I already knew that we had these combo windows that him and I monitored, but we did not have that piece that provided the operational security. So when I got back from that trip a uh, week before last, I decided to come up with these contact cards. I'll share these with the Buy Me A Coffee folks so that they can use the template to make their own contact cards. And the goal of these cards is to be able to give these out to other people in your network so that they have the contact information. Um, again, this is a very poor man's technique I came up with where I basically designated a handful of in-state contacts that I wanted someone else in my network to be able to contact, as well as a couple of outstate contacts. And the reason for that is there may be a localized emergency that prevents me from communicating with my in-state personal contacts, but there are other family members outside of my state uh, that could potentially help communicate uh, to other members of the family. Again, it's not always going to be a scenario where the entire U.S. is fully down in terms of the grid. It may be a localized emergency. So yeah, those contact cards were really simple. It was designed to be basically follow the KISS philosophy. So what is the designation ID? What is your current status? I opted just for a handful. Uh, usually it is okay. And then some very concise message that provides where I am and potentially my current situation and when I plan to be back home. So really simple guys. So uh, hopefully you got something out of this. So those four things are going to be critical. If I had to add a fifth thing, it's really having the motivation to do steps one through four. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about are those two antennas, uh, clearly two completely different tools. So for this personal communication where I knew I wanted to contact Mike, I really wanted to use Envis so that I have that regional communication or range of communication. And the vertical antennas are not really well suited to do that uh, because in general they have very low takeoff angles so you end up having 
uh, a considerable skip zone. So you could skip right over that local contact. As it turns out, that antenna did have um, enough high takeoff angles where it was able to do that 200-ish, 200 uh, mile contact or so. So really happy with that. Uh, but again, it is a compromise. Uh, that antenna did not perform as well compared to the dipole, but it was also uh, better for uh, ease of deployment, speed of deployment, and also used a smaller footprint. Uh, but then again, it required a tuner. So again, there's no one perfect antenna. So for me, I'm actually gonna run both of them. The one thing I like about the dipole is that that antenna is very performant. And if conditions were bad, that one would actually work. And that one actually is an excellent performer in the way it was deployed for regional communication. And then additionally, I also have the ability to repair it in the field because it is just wire. I have been able to improvise broken or fixing broken wire in the field with no tools whatsoever, basically just using my fingernails to uh, remove insulation. Uh, but the downside is that antenna takes a little bit of time. It took me 10 minutes to set up and requires a lot of space. It was going off um, 33 feet in either direction for a total footprint of about 66 feet. Um, on that note too, the uh, power lines didn't do me any favor uh, or favors. Uh, there was quite a bit of noise on my side, so I had difficulty hearing other stations. Uh, thankfully, the bands actually cooperated and when we moved into that window, uh, the bands did open up and we were able to make that contact happen. All right, guys, I am very limited on time, so apologies for how late these videos are coming out. Um, and how often I'm able to drop them, which is not very often. So I do want to thank all the guys on Buy Me a Coffee. You guys are amazing. Uh, lots of stuff coming on the MCOM Tools Community Edition. I even got some uh, new tins for that, and we've got a site coming up. But yeah, appreciate you guys. So I'm the Tech Prepper. Be strong, be safe, and be prepared.